Tourette's podcast is not a medical advice show. It's a show about experiences. In the course of that, we may talk about medications or therapies or stories from the doctor's office, but don't mistake any of that for medical advice or direction. It's not. Get that only from people or places licensed or certified to give it. Not from a massively fun and action-packed podcast about our life experiences. Such as. And I just remember out of nowhere, my neck snapped and my head just like found itself flung towards the desk. This is Tourette's Podcast. I'm Ben Brown. So a big fun part of my life is photography. I love doing event photography. I like interesting portraits. I love, love, love street photography. Love looking at photos. I love taking photos. I love playing with cameras and by way of all of this, I listen to a, a number of various, you know, photography podcasts and, and, and have some websites I like to go to to read up on what's happening in the photography world. And so about two weeks ago, I read this article on one of those websites, uh, petapixel.com, photography website. And the headline said this. It was a question. Do you look through the viewfinder with your dominant eye? So that was the headline to this article. Do you look through the viewfinder with your dominant eye? And it's funny, I'd never really thought about it. Like, I'm right-handed, and that's obvious to me, but I hadn't really put much thought into whether I had a dominant eye, like the eye that I use to look through the viewfinder of the camera when I'm taking pictures. And when I got to thinking about it, I couldn't even answer the question for myself, like just actively thinking about which eye I use when I'm photographing. I couldn't. You know, it's kind of like the thing where you try to remember somebody's phone number, and it's not coming to mind. But if you had a phone, like a keypad in front of you and you dialed it, you could do it easily. But anyway, so just to kind of answer this for myself, I reached over on my desk and I grabbed a camera and I tried to be natural, try to put it up to my face, and I couldn't naturally do it. I was second guessing how to naturally hold my camera and what eye I put it up to. And so later on, I I caught myself using my right eye, you know, when I was photographing without thinking about it. So I guess that's it. I lead with my right eye. But what I'm getting to is this. When I use my right eye for photography, I close my left eye. You know, like you raise the camera to your face, you look through the viewfinder with one eye, and you close the other. That's what I do. And from thinking about all this so much, like overthinking this whole dominant eye thing, I've developed a new tick where I close my left eye, just like I'd be doing it, you know, when I'm taking a photograph. I kind of clamp it down, you know, like it's a real earnest wink. And so my wife noticed it a few days ago. And she asks me about it, and I'm like, well, I guess that's a new tick, and I hope nobody gets the wrong idea, this left eye winking tick. But but now, because I guess I feel like I have the need to balance it out. You can probably relate to this. I feel like I need to balance out that tick. So when I do my left eye winking tick, I follow it with an identical wink on the right side now. That's like as of today. So I tick on my left side, makes me feel lopsided. I tick on the right side. And that's not a thought process I go through. That's just what happens. And for first-time listeners or listeners who don't have Tourette syndrome, there's virtually nothing I can do about this. I mean, there's medications, there's therapies and things like that that may have an impact, but this is a tick. It happens. And, you know, similar things have come up in, in conversations on this podcast before, this, this winking tick, which overall is, is pretty common. But I, I hadn't put much thought before now into you know, hobbies or everyday activities I have that might be informing my tics. This one seems directly related to photography, which I do all the time. Now, do do I know that my left eye winking tic started because I read an article that got me thinking about my eyes and how one of them winks and it just happens to be my left eye? I mean, no, I, I don't know that's what caused the tic, this whole photography article, but I don't know where any of my tics come from, really. Oddly enough, when I actually do raise my camera to my eye, to my right eye, and then close my left eye. That doesn't feel the same as, as the tick, as doing the tick. Like shooting a photograph and closing my left eye, I don't get the same satisfaction or whatever the right word is from it. It's just so easy to overthink this stuff. And I was thinking, you know, it's something on its own to be the owner of these uncontrollable movements and noises. But then getting caught up in my own feedback, wondering where the tick came from and then wondering why I'm even wondering and, you know, what good it does me if I can't control it anyway. And, you know, is my time better spent just being comfortable with my ticks, just letting them happen without overrunning the analysis department of my brain? And so I'm just going to file this under stuff that people with Tourette syndrome think about. But have you thought about this? I mean, have you thought about your everyday activities and whether or not they directly inform your ticks 
like a motion or a sound that you naturally do in another sense? Is that repeated in the tick somewhere? If you thought about that, let me know. Tourette's podcast at gmail.com, or you can go to the uh, Tourette's podcast discussion group on Facebook. This is just one of those funny Tourette problems. Shout out to Laura, who does the Tourette's Probs account on Twitter, tweeting out stuff like this that kind of gets at these, these unsolved personal mysteries of having TS and how it's always good for an awkward surprise when it's not a funny companion. And I, I got the word companion from how Melissa C. Water describes her TS. I've loved using that word ever since. Got a question here submitted on the Facebook group. Nancy is the mother of a child with Tourette syndrome, and she says, There are statistics about the symptoms of TS going away in adulthood, and I've read and watched YouTubers talk about their hope that they grow out of their tics. I'm curious about how many people grow out of their TS symptoms, or if it's more that you've learned to manage them better in adulthood. Nancy, that's a great question. In the uh, the finale to season two, it was a two-part finale, episodes 15A and 15B. In episode 15A, we talked a little bit about that. There was some science we discussed. I'll link to it in the show notes with this episode at Tourette'sPodcast.Libson.com. But we talked about the findings of a study of people who were diagnosed a long time ago, and it's kind of catching up with them and seeing how they're doing, and did your tics go away, and how are you, you, know, how are you managing with life? I had some of the same questions, too, about you know whether it's just we feel better about having Tourette syndrome because we've learned to deal with it better. Basically, with this study, at the end of the day, the take-home was that it, it looked pretty good overall in terms of improving in life. Maybe you took less, or maybe you just have a better handle on them. The people they caught up with in this study said they were doing better in their lives. But overall, according to this paper, and, and again, uh, it's a really good episode. We talked with Dr. Matthew Capriotti. He was one of the authors, who we're actually going to hear more from. But anyway, this study, long-term prognosis, good. But comorbid problems may persist. Could be that ticks go away, but there may be some comorbidities, things that typically orbit Tourette syndrome, that stay with you in life. I know I'm not fully answering your question. It definitely happens at ticks ease up. Obviously, that's not universal. But I'd love to hear from anybody else out there who has any who has any studies or resources that can better address this. Better than me, I mean. But again, I'm going to link to this paper in the notes with this episode at Tourette'sPodcast.Libson.com. Tourette Awareness Month is coming up here, uh, May 15th through June 15th. And I want to go ahead and ask, you know, even though we're still, we're a little less than a month away from it, but I'm curious what you guys do, if anything, for Tourette Awareness Month. What do you do and why? And if you don't do anything, what would interest you in doing something for it? You know, what would be the purpose of participating in the beacon of time that is Tourette Awareness Month? The Tourette Association of America has a resource page with ideas for you. Uh, I'll link to that in the show notes with this episode at Tourette'sPodcast.Libson.com. But I know you're going to find plenty of inspiration on the social media channels very soon. A lot of events coming up, and I know we're going to be talking about them here. What I was thinking of doing, for starters, so you know I said a couple weeks ago that I started this Patreon page, uh, patreon.com slash Tourette's Podcast. That's how you can support the show if you want to. And there are some really, really, truly appreciated people donating to the show to help cover some of the, the costs of doing the podcast. And, and I was thinking of, of personally matching whatever money I raised there for a month and kind of donating that doubled amount on behalf of everyone listening or interacting with the show. Is that cool? Is that a good idea? So in other words, I'm going to donate a month of proceeds from the Tourette's Podcast uh, Patreon page, and then I'll double that money. And one reason it's good for me to do that is I don't want anybody to think that this is just a ploy to encourage people to sign up for the Patreon page. So I'm putting skin in the game too, and I'm obviously totally open to your thoughts and suggestions. Is there a better way I could do this? Initial thinking is donating the money to the Tourette Association because they put a lot into Tourette Awareness Month here. It's May 15th through June 15th. And I know you're hoping we might get to this week's conversation before Awareness Month begins, so let's get to it. So, photography. And no, this is not a regression to the beginning of the episode. Let me just say, I'm happy with my photography. I'm always wanting to, to learn and try new things, but I like the work that I do and the shots I get. But then I look at the work of Alex Kozobalis, and I'm like, oh, man, like this is good photography. His work is truly, truly good, and just looking at it for the first time inspired me, especially his artistic portraits, just fantastic. And then I heard his music, and again, I was like, just, ugh, like, there it is again. Like, this is good music. This is really well done. It's exactly what I love. He's really gifted, and I truly think more people need to check him out. Alex Kazabalas, our Tourette conversation this week. Here's me and Alex. And if you need a language warning, there's a, just a couple words here and there. Nothing out of control. 
Should I give you the full name? The full name's the full name's entertaining. Yeah, let's let, let's hear the full name if you're comfortable giving it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alexander Constantine Patrick Kozabolis, <laughs> formerly known as Alex. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm based around London and Brighton. Yeah, UK. Uh, I'm glad that we could finally get up because you know we've been talking for you know some time now, and we actually mm-hmm. tried to meet up when my wife and I were over in Europe back in October, getting married and. I mean, we were really close at one point, but we never got to make it work with our schedules. So I'm really happy we get to to do this now. And, you know, we've been writing back and forth. And just like me, I mean, me kind of getting to know you, uh, you're into music making, you do photography, a lot of stuff that I'm into as well. And you do really, really excellent work, by the way. Uh, is is that what you're doing professionally? Is Do you do photography professionally? It's, it's, it's kind of a mixture of all of it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's taken quite a long time to get to that point. Right. And it's also taken quite a long time to to own it as well, as in to, to be okay with telling people that, that I do that stuff. I get that. Um, yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's that sort of thing yeah. where some people <laughs> call it imposter syndrome, where you, you know, you, you might be, you know, personally confident in your own abilities, but there's, mm-hmm. it takes guts to step out and call yourself a professional when other people are doing that and making nice livings at it and doing work that you admire. And then you kind of put your work up there with theirs and say, Hey, I'm a professional too. It, it definitely takes some, some time to kind of build up to that. Yeah. I, to, to be completely honest, I would, I would say, I'm, I would say I'm not really there in terms of, in terms of how I, I view it myself. Like I, I know what I love doing. It looks pretty good to me. <laughs> I appreciate that, man. And I, yeah, and I, and I, and again, it's, it's it's lovely when other people like it too. But the, I don't know the 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 the, the word professional impl- it just has so many implications that mm-hmm. I just don't feel like I live up to that in so many senses. But some some of which I'm glad that I don't live up to. I'm glad I don't walk around in a suit with a briefcase. Nothing against that, but it's not for me. Yeah. But yeah, I, I don't feel like I embody professionalism at all. <laughs> <laughs> like the, the stuff that I love doing, I do because. I love doing it. And I was a mixture of lucky and stubborn enough hmm. sticking with it when it didn't work out to the point where it eventually did work out. Yeah. And when honestly, like with the technical stuff as well, I just feel like I know a lot less of the technical side of things than other people doing this. So I'd be very, uh, yeah, like I said, happy to own the fact that the things I love doing, but mm-hmm. classifying it otherwise is tricky sometimes. Yeah. Well, you know, th- and that kind of puts it in the court of art a little bit, but I mean, it- it's it's definitely, I think, <laughs> sort of professionally viable work that you're doing, and 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 even if you do just want to call it, you know, something that you love doing that you happen to 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 be good at, and th- th- those are my words. I mean, I do think you're really good at it. It it, it just seems to kind of come up again and again, and you know, with the the sort of musical angle on you as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you could zoom out and say, you know, well, everybody has a connection to music one way or another, or almost everybody, mm-hmm. but it just seems like it's such a recurring thing that there's a creative proclivity or, or just, just, mm-hmm. just something in that field that seems to be kind of amplified in people who have Tourette syndrome. And, and I'm saying that completely observationally, not, <clears throat> not I don't have any data or anything like that, but <laughs> I mean, is, is that something that mm-hmm. you've observed or thought about? I should I should be really honest. Like I, again, it's, it's it's very kind of you to 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 include me under the, the the banner of good. If I am good now, what I do is because there was a lot of shit that came before that. M- music's probably the music's probably about one to go into in terms of overtly linking it to, to Tourette's. In that I wasn't a particularly musical child at all. Mm-hmm. My earliest musical memory is aged about six, which I think is quite late given how innate <laughs> music mm. and rhythm is. Yeah. Um, I remember the, do you know the Birdie song? The Birdie like the song. Instrumental... I don't know if I do. <laughs> oh, that okay. One. Yeah, yeah. No, it's in my head now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But my mum got me like some kind of, oh, it's ridiculously 90s, like some kind of party mega mix double. Cause... <laughs> like now that's what I call music or one of those compilations or? Yeah, no, this was actually called party mega mix. Party Megam, okay. I wasn't that. That's not kind of in my everyday vocabulary. So like that was a direct quote, <laughs> rather than how I would actively choose to describe it. <laughs> but it was. Um, I just remember the Birdie song was on that man, and like as a six-year-old, that was like epiphany time. Um, so that's kind of that's 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 it really. That's that started it off for me. Um, <laughs> and then obviously, thankfully, I got into other stuff as well. But, sure. Um, yeah. But that was just on a listening level. Like in terms of playing stuff, that. 
that that took a lot longer. Like I had trumpet lessons for three months when I was eleven, and I just couldn't do it. Um, I can appreciate the sound of the trumpet, and I love it more now, way more now than I did then. Yeah, but I really struggled with it. Uh, I think. Have you ever, have you ever played the trumpet or any wind instruments? No, I've I've never played the trumpet, but but I do quickly relate to like that technical side of it is never really what I've been good at. So so when I when my parents put me into violin when I was, you know, four or five years old, that that was in the environment where I had to learn how to read music and I had to learn, you know, the, the vocabulary. And I think because of that sort of even though it is an art form, that emphasis on the sort of academic or technical side of it, I think that's what tripped me up. And even though that, you know, violin's a beautiful instrument, I love listening to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it took me kind of figuring out music on my own, my own way later on for me to, to just go head first into it and really, really figure out ways to express myself with music. And that is to say, it would be somewhat unconventional music and things that I could relate to that that felt way more like art than it did some sort of uh discipline I guess you could say yeah or academic exercise no I, no I totally get that so so were you like a child prodigy on the violin aside from oh the, no I I, <laughs> I was the I, th there's actually th there's a recording that my mom gave me a, a little while ago mm -hmm. that I, I digitized it was on a cassette tape and it's me playing violin when I'm I think I'm five years old and I'm just mm. doing this this disastrous job playing, I think like Minuet 3 or, or something like that. And and at the end of it, you can hear me, like my five-year-old self, saying out loud, like, I don't think that was very good. And um, <laughs> man, if, if I can find that file, I'll, I'll drop it into the episode. But but it, yeah, it, it was nothing I really, uh, I think I was maybe at first excited at the prospect of learning, you know, owning a violin and kind of learning it. And but but when it kind of presented itself as something that felt more like school or like homework, then mm -hmm. I kind of disconnected from it. And, you know, it's like, OK, well, I guess violin's not for me or I guess music isn't for me. And then still loving, you know, listening to music and listening to my dad's records and all that, I wanted to learn how to do that kind of thing. And that's, I guess, why, you know, rock and roll and later on, you know, like indie rock and punk rock and stuff like that in the 90s were uh, something I, you know, really kind of just, just felt at home with. And because I think it was more chaotic and less disciplined. No, so I'm just, I'm just thinking, um, no, it's, 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 a, it's a similar kind of thing. Like, like the, the punchline would be very similar. The route, the route to it would be a little bit different. Right. I mean, the trumpet lessons were more, that was more of a physical thing, really. I think, I hadn't played any instruments before that, but I felt kind of disconnected a little bit from the trumpet and my understanding from other wind instruments. And I played saxophone very, very briefly a lot later in life. I do mean briefly. I mean, I went to one class and then <laughs> yeah, something really awkward happened there. So I never went back. Yeah. I played t-ball for one day too. <laughs> I feel like I need to explain that because that's going to sound weird if I just leave it as hanging as something awkward happened. Basically, I went with this girl that I knew and it was a completely platonic trip to a saxophone class <laughs> and then as we got there and took our saxophones out of the cases literally this was like in the first 10 minutes of the class this girl who I she was cool man like she was a nice friend but like I wasn't interested in leans over to me and goes don't you just think the saxophone is the sexiest instrument and that was it that was like saxophone <laughs> dreams class yeah. gone in one sentence gone <laughs> but where i was going with that is that what i what i liked about the saxophone aside from its sound and, and breadth of sounds was that it's connected to your breath yeah and the trumpet is as well but not quite as direct as the trumpet you have to purse your lips and kind of make a fart noise through your mouth yeah yeah to, to play music and that just comedy aside like <laughs> that just I just really struggled with that. I just, it just didn't feel natural. So anyway, I, I, I ditched music. And then it wasn't until I was in my last year of 
what you guys would call high school or mm-hmm. secondary school in the Queen's English. Right. Um, that I started sort of wandering into music blocks at school. I had, I'm happy to go more into this stuff if it comes up like later, but like sure. didn't really have a great time like in the last couple of years of school. Tourette's, which I still didn't know. Yeah, I didn't know it by that name. I knew it was something I had, but hmm. didn't know what it was. Assumed it was just me that was experiencing it anyway. And other stuff that was going on, like I just kind of ended up drifting into the music blocks and finding the pianos and playing them when there weren't classes on there and stuff. And and the stuff I was playing sounded like it, it sounded completely shit. That's not me being harsh to form of me. It's just being objective. <laughs> like it wasn't good music. Right. It wasn't even music, but but it was kind of irrelevant. It was like there was a genuine <laughs> connection between the stuff I was feeling and the, and the stuff that was coming out. Um, and that sense of being able to connect innermost thoughts with however primitive outward expressions of those, yeah, man, was, was addictive. Mm-hmm. So I just, I just kept going back. Yeah. And, and the more I went back, the less shit it sounded. <laughs> and I still, <laughs> still kind of maintain that logic. <laughs> it's very, very trial and error based. <laughs> So that was that was kind of the route to music. Um, I'm trying to think. Parents, in terms of listening to music, my mum, my mum listened to a lot of stuff. She she listened to a lot of soul music actually when I was growing up. So I, mm. I think that's stuff that I've I've grown to love. Oh um, god, yeah, I mean that's some of the best music ever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, man, completely. My dad was my dad was a lot more niche. My, with my dad, we'd uh, we'd practically listen to Greek radio, local Greek radio at any given opportunity, mm. which again, like stuck in kind of teenage. Um, <laughs> that reminded mode I really couldn't appreciate right, uh, yeah. it felt very monocultural but the further I've come from that the more the more I've actually wanted to go back to it and like I love traditional Greek music and folk music and, and all the influences that have poured into it like Rembrandtica that, that sort of thing or yeah Rembrandtica yeah exactly like the um, like all the bouzouki music and stuff and it's it's, it's amazing because it's, it's I guess the uh it was very democratic music and it would often be like any, any kind of folk tradition or music based on any kind of folk traditions would be, you know, it'd be the music of the people. So the, these would be real stories that people were saying right, yeah. and communicating in these things. But yeah, yeah. So no, I guess, I guess in terms of the stuff I was listening to, that was kind of the influence in that sense. But hmm. yeah, yeah. So in, indie rock and Rebetica on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> but I went through a Nirvana phase, I should say. Like, I went through that standard 13, 14 year old, like, well, at least in the mid nineties. Like oh yeah, yeah. Grungy face, yeah. Yeah, necessary. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> completely. Yeah. Well, you said something in there that that was interesting um, about knowing you had something, but not necessarily identifying it uh, by the by the mm-hmm. words Tourette syndrome. C- could you explain that a little bit further? Yeah. So I mean, I I can't remember the first tip, but I remember the rough kind of era that they started, and that was around. I think I must have been five or six. <laughs> and mm. I just started I was at school and I just was coughing repeatedly right and it just wouldn't go and again like objective distant hat on I know from tiny brushes with childhood psychology that having ticks at that kind of age is quite a common thing and kids can grow out so I understand why that in and of itself wasn't an instant diagnosis or even like a massive cause for concern yeah but uh, so that was the case. The next massive chunk I remember was like, uh, as I know, uh, that was hap- that was happening. Like the, the throat clearing, mm-hmm. it grew into um, into eye blinking, eye blinking, as if you can blink something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> repetitive blinking when I was when I was about eleven, and yeah, that was intense. Like mm-hmm. then the next big phase was when I was fifteen or sixteen, and that was my head started jerking. Um, I know these are basically massive tick milestones rather than isolated events. Like the ticks were happening and waxing and waning throughout that period. But yeah, these were like the points where massive ones were introduced to the mix. Hmm. Um, like the head jerk thing. I, I remember the exact moment that that happened. I was, it was, we have, a, we have, um, an exam system in this country. Actually, I don't even know if we do anymore. <laughs> this is, oh, this is the problem with aging. Right. Yeah. Um, I feel like, <laughs> um, we had these things called GCSEs. I don't even, I don't know if they're still called that. Um, previously they were called O-levels and they became GCSEs. Now I don't know what they're called. Okay. And I was in the back of a chemistry lab and we were preparing for the exams. And I just remember out of nowhere, my neck snapped and my head just like found itself flung towards the desk. Like not to the point where it would hit the desk. Yeah. But it, it woke up some part of my brain that loved it. I was like, yeah, more huh. of that. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. that became, 
and that became the the the, the most defining tick for for the best part of a decade. And I, I still have it, but I've learned to live with it since then and, and kind of tone it and curb it hmm. to the point where people probably don't recognize that that's even a tick anymore, I think. Um, but yeah, sorry, so I'm, I'm digressing. Like the, the, the thing of knowing that something existed, but um, and in one sense, owning it as part of my identity, but not really knowing what it was. Um, so in terms of all that stuff, yeah, I had these things that, that I'd basically been living with for as long as I could remember and were being added to. And if I tried to stop them, I couldn't stop them. So I was like, well, I don't really seem to have a crazy amount of choice in this. But at the same time, like, I also seem to be complicit in, in their happening. Hmm. Like, I make myself do this stuff. Yeah. But yeah, I can't seem to stop making myself doing this stuff. And yeah, like standard kid journey. Like, I'd met however many, what, thousands of people you meet by the time you're 17 or 18. Yeah. And not one of them had had this stuff. So I was like, okay, well, logically, this follows that I am the only person in the known universe with this. <laughs> of course, yeah. Which probably maybe helped foster unhealthy levels of, I don't want to say egocentricity, because that implies kind of arrogance, but maybe there, maybe there were but maybe there were arrogant manifestations, but definitely the opposite end of it as mm -hmm. well. Right. But the main thing was, yeah, like I totally felt this is something that no one else can relate to. There can't possibly be. A, I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that there might be a name for it. It's like there is a name for it. It's Alexander Constantine Patrick Cosapolis. <laughs> right. Because it's me. Like yeah. no one else has this. And in one sense, even though I'm, now that I know it's Tourette's, in one sense that's true because no one has the same version of Tourette's. So cool. The identity point stands. Sure. Yeah. But yeah, at that point it was strangely, I, I don't even know if I can say it was isolating because again, it is what it was. Um, that was my only experience of it. So in hindsight, yeah, it was isolating. And I think there were parts of me that, yeah, definitely felt tinges of isolation because of that. Definitely felt different. I was like, huh, no one else seems to be doing this. That's, that's interesting. Um, yeah. yeah. And especially at the points where, yeah, where the reactions to it weren't <laughs> remotely close to positive. Yeah. It's hard at those points to, to be more objective or to have some sense of perspective on it, especially when you don't even know what the hell is going on. Um, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that kind of covers some of that. Yeah. I mean, well, how, how long did that go before, you know, how long did you let it go with something kind of, uh, unidentified before you or, or somebody in your family said, let's figure out what this is once and for all. Um, the family side of it's a little bit complicated because I, I kind of grew up with both parents separate from a very young age. So yeah, the response to Tourette's was very different mm. in, in the different households. Okay. Um, and I won't say which was which, but like, um, in one of them, it was, uh, actually, no, that, that's, that's unfair actually. And there's, and there's no reason not to be objective about it. Like with my mom, it was a lot more, there was a lot more acceptance. Um, and with my dad, there was a lot more, there was a lot more criticism hmm. and I guess yeah, obstructiveness as far as that went. Again, looking back at it in hindsight, I can kind of see why that was the case. I think my dad had grown up in a very, in a background really, he had a lot of hardships in his early stages in life. And I think from a material perspective, I think he felt like that the life that I was being given access to was, was a really good shot. And I don't think he wanted me to convince myself that there was something I had, which was going to hold me back. Uh, and I think yeah. his way of, so I, in that sense, I, I feel like, and I, I can only see this now through hindsight, but I feel like his criticism of, it, I feel like was in a really weird way rooted in love, but it didn't feel like love at the time. I get that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just one sec. <clears throat> Y'all good. You want to take a break? Oh, uh, it's a weird one, man. No, it's, it's, it's one of these weird things. Like, cause I, cause I do mean what I said, like, and I can see the, I can see the intent. I think I can see what I feel like was the intent behind it. Yeah. Kind of having come out of it, but it's, yeah. it's a weird one to, to think back to. Um, but yeah, sorry, sorry. No, anyway, the long story short, like it, the response to it was different in, in, in different households. Yeah. Um, so it was, my mom was, was very empathetic towards it, especially when the head, when the, the, the severe head jerk started, I'd come back and I'd be visibly exhausted. And, and you know, then the response would be, it'd be very reassuring. It'd be consoling and it would be like, oh, you must be exhausted with that. And I'd be like, yeah, I am. It is exhausting. And not through any fault or anything, but I think, her having grown up seeing me just be like this, I think I think for her she must have just assumed, well, this is this is just something how he uses. It's not crazily holding him back. Like he's not 
um, he's not restricted in other areas of life. He's he's communicative. He's functional in every other sense. Like so, I, mm-hmm. I can kind of see why it wouldn't have necessarily seemed like this is something that we must urgently sort out. Plus the fact that she wouldn't she wouldn't have seen that much of me either at different points. So to to, to come out of that in terms of because I feel like what you were kind of leading up to was like. How long was that going on for? When was the diagnosis? The diagnosis was at 23. Okay. And that came about, um, I ended up going to, to uni a couple of times and dropping out. And then I stumbled through various different jobs and ended up in a, in a youth work type job, working with teenagers, uh, just kind of after school clubs type thing. And it was there when I was working with the team that, yeah, I kind of grew more aware of the Tourette's again in a way that I hadn't been for a few years. And I think it was through hanging around with younger kids who are way less inhibited and would hmm. actively hold up those mirrors again and be like, why are you doing this? Right. They would replicate what I was doing. I was like, oh yeah, shit, I thought yeah. I was getting better with this. <laughs> um, and um, I just remember, um, yeah, and I was talking to a, a girl that I worked with about it. And um, yeah, and we kind of like, kind of batted around like the possibility of, of autism. And that, that, was, that was like completely pseudo-scientifically based. Mm-hmm. It's like we had no reason for really thinking that, but we just, she thought like, hey, there's stuff that you do that other people don't do. There's maybe there's like some kind of brain activity thing. And anyway, what I ended up doing was one afternoon after work, I took all the stuff, like the symptoms, and I just, yeah, I fed them into this this new oracle that was emerging that we now know as Google. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah. it returned to me like the results of this forum. And on this forum, it was some mum talking about her kid who had crazily similar symptoms to what I just typed in. Yeah. And then out of nowhere, this, this word Tourette's syndrome appeared. And up until that point, the only time I'd heard that was, I think, I think it was, I, I, ironically, the guy's American, right? Tim Howard. I think it was through him. Like yeah. he was, mm-hmm. he was a goalkeeper, I think at that stage, probably for Man United. So I'd loosely heard about it through that. But <laughs> again, the irony of someone who turns out to have Tourette's only associating it as like the swearing thing. Like I was just, I didn't know anything about it. Right. I was like, I, I don't have that. I don't, I'd swear a lot, <laughs> but that's, that's, I'm completely complicit in that. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's a very roundabout way of, of, uh, that wasn't even the diagnosis, sorry, but that was, that was the, that wasn't even a seed. That was like the harvest, not the harvest, but like this, what do you do? Like when you tear up the ground and plant like a million seeds. Oh yeah. When you that till it up. And, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was the tilling. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, and then that very quickly led to me going to to my local doctor, who equally didn't have a clue what Tourette's was. He actually had to look it up in a medical dictionary when I <laughs> approached him, which is, in hindsight, like, yeah, hilarious. sounds good to me. Yep. Um, <laughs> and then he referred me to a specialist neurologist at, um, at a hospital in South London, and and the guy was like a was a guy called Doctor Moriarty, who I mean, yeah, at some point I should try and get in touch with. But I had a meeting with him, and very quickly I was like. Not in these words, obviously, like in more medical terms, but like, yeah, you have Tourette's. What do you want to do about it now? Do you want to medicate or do you want to carry on living as you've lived with it up till now? What were you, I mean, that's it's, it's a lot to think about, introducing a medication into your body and, you know, if the question's put to you or if it was put to me right now and I'm just learning about myself, I don't really, you know, I, I guess I would have more questions about what does medication mean for my life? Uh, what was that thought process like for you? Sure, yeah. So I, I, I can't remember if it was, if the time frame was quite as small as I just made it seem, it, that might have been a second meeting. It could have, it could well have been that there was an initial diagnosis in March two thousand seven, yeah. and then there might there was definitely a follow up meeting, and it could have been, maybe that's it. It could have been on that follow up meeting that, that the medication possibility was was brought up, or maybe he he asked yeah. about it the first time. It was like maybe we can talk about it more the second time. It might have been more like that. That makes sense. So either way, I can't remember the exact, I can't remember the exact ingredients for that, but I remember. I remember the thought process being along the lines of this is something that for better or worse, I've learned to live with. And again, for better or worse, consider inextricably linked to my sense of identity. Um, like that's a given, Like I know where I stand with that stuff and, yeah. and I'm getting a better grasp over my weaknesses and knowing what this sudden, suddenly actually knowing what this is, that it actually has a name. Like that's, that's 90% of that work done. That's a mm-hmm. huge boost. Huge. So, again, without wanting to make any statement on on the taking of drugs for, for for things for symptoms, like for me personally, it was like, yeah, I've learned to live with it. I don't like the idea of something suddenly entering my system and taking away what is, again, for better or worse, part of my identity. 
I didn't think I could do that to myself. Yeah. And so I didn't. And I don't know whether that was the right decision or not. Because in terms of actually wanting relief from the ticks, a hundred percent. But yeah. But even that had been getting better. And I, and and I, and I, it's hard to exp- well. Maybe, maybe I'd like to hear about how how uh, your diagnosis came about as well. But like, but this thing for me of of having it, yeah, like most of my life, not most of, well, yeah, yeah, it was most yeah. of my life. It was like six to the point of diagnosis and. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I get that. Mm-hmm. I mean, w- wanting, you know, because th- there can be ticks that are you know really aggravating. They can be painful. They can keep you up at night. And, you know, for practical purposes, you might want to, you know, do something about them. But at the same time that you I, I, I totally get the question, totally relate to the question of uh, of is this something that's also going to alter me mm-hmm. uh, in, in other ways? Am I not going to act like myself anymore because there's something in in this diagnosis that does have to do with how I kind of compose myself and see the world and and if you've gotten used to that and if you have you know an appreciation for that it's something that you don't want to you know I, I I think I end up respecting everybody's answer to that question of yeah. do you medicate or not because it, it's just it's so circumstantial mm-hmm. it's such a sliding thing you know I, ideally yeah. if you don't have to do anything you don't have to do anything and that's fine mm-hmm. if mm-hmm. it's something that is really kind of debilitating and or limiting or mm-hmm. you know whatever the right word is then yeah i mean i, I would never judge anybody for of course not. Uh, no. for you know what you're, you're asking about my diagnosis mm-hmm. yeah, uh, yeah. I, I was i was really young you know i i was i was like five or six years old maybe seven mm-hmm. and my parents i, I guess my, my ticking was so out of hand and my hyperactivity was so out of hand. I, I never slept. It was just too right. much for them to wear. Medication, I think, ended up being, and plus, you know, this being the the mid 1980s, mm-hmm. Tourette syndrome was nothing that, uh, and even in today's sense, people don't necessarily have a universal knowledge of it. But back nope. then, people definitely didn't. And so, the sort of norms of uh, medicating your kid and what's the medication going to do, and what are the pluses and minuses, yeah. w- it was all very exploratory and. So when they put me on medications and they turned me into a zombie and, uh, I I think it was just them kind of witnessing the, the negative effects that medication was, was having on me. Mm. And, um, and I I don't want to vilify medications because they, you know, they're they're completely necessary for a lot of people and, and, and do a lot of good. But, uh, when I made the decision later on to kind of separate myself from medication and if memory serves, it was cold Turkey. I just stopped. Yeah. Uh, it was because, um, one, I didn't like what medication was doing to me, but also, uh, I, I felt like I was just kind of drifting away from the natural me that I knew I was. And, mm. uh, I, I had this explosion of interest after I stopped medicating, had this explosion of interest in, uh, creative pursuits. And I was always into art and drawing and, mm-hmm. you know, painting and music conceptually and all that. But when I got off medication it, and correlation is not, you know, is, is all that is. But uh, at that time, I definitely just had this explosion of interest in kind of, you know, embracing the the weirdness, so to speak, and and kind of making something of it and getting into music that was, you know, a, a little bit more agitated and not not quite as clean cut and yeah. just kind of finding my identity there i felt like that whole thing was over the period of several 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 years of trials and errors mm. ending up at a place where i didn't want to medicate myself and then i did kind of I, I guess accept or embrace my own kind of personality at that point even though i was not mm-hmm. uh open about having tourette syndrome because i was worried about the ridicule I mean, what did you worry about that or did you think about that uh given that what your understanding of Tourette syndrome was before the diagnosis and after when you realize what I have is Tourette syndrome. Is that something you were comfortable talking about openly or, or how did that go? I think it depended a lot on the situation and it still does. It still does less, less, less mm-hmm. so I guess, but, um, no, sorry. I was just going to say, I was going to say something about what you, what you were saying. I, like, I, 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 no, I'm totally with you on, on your stance on medication. I, I feel similarly. I feel like each story is, or each, not even each story, each person's story, each person, mm-hmm. yeah, is, is unique, and every every situation yeah. is different, and it's there isn't there isn't a blanket answer for it. Um, it's my concern sometimes when medication is sometimes promoted as a blanket answer to it. I think that's I think that's right. where um, skepticism and other stuff should enter the equation. But I, I agree with you. I, I don't think there is 
provided that things have been thought through and things have been balanced out, I don't think there is a there is, I don't think there is a right or wrong answer. Like it's it's, right. it's, it's mm-hmm. interesting hearing your your journey through that stuff as well. No, it's an interesting one. I mean, it's 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 kind of a difficult one to answer because yeah. So given that I didn't know what it was till twenty three, I I think the most interesting time to have probably had to to have been thinking about that question. Not that it isn't relevant now, but probably would have been around right. like the, yeah, like you say, like the teenage years and how I would have responded to it if I yeah if I'd known what it was and whether whether mm-hmm. then I would have chosen to to say it to people or not. Maybe that's a hypothetical I can think of in my own time. But um, in terms of in terms of <laughs> in terms of now. Um, like, yeah, I think I'd wear it a lot more comfortably. I, I, no, actually, it is probably relevant to factor in the teenagers because it was so much more obvious that I had something then, I think. Hmm. Okay. Um, like, I think you could, you could, if, say, this was a filmed interview, I think you'd probably, I, I think you'd probably struggle to see some of it. Some of it would be apparent, I think, particularly for people with Tourette's or Tourette's for a long time and, and, an, and an, an awareness of some of the more nuanced sides of it. Um, like maybe the more covert yeah. ticks. I think people would spot them, but I think the untrained eye or the average civilian, <laughs> um, I think, I think they've really struggled to see something. Um, yeah. mm-hmm. but when I was, when I was a kid, it was very different. It was like, there's something different about that. Guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> the one that's like changing height every second because his next there and then it's there and then it's there. Right. Uh, yeah. That kid, um, maybe it'd have been, maybe it'd have been handy in some context to have been able to say like, you know what, he's up. This is, this is what I have. It's not something I have control over. But equally being a 16 year old, maybe, maybe that wouldn't have been the cool thing to say. Maybe I would have overstored it. Maybe I, I, I feel like maybe I would have come out of it feeling similarly to you, that maybe it's better to just live with the direct implications and the, yeah, the piss taking all right. that stuff than it would be to live with the, the misinterpretations or like the, the, the knack going around the school. But it's a hypothetical right. that yeah. is fascinating. Um, and I'd love to have known what younger me would have chosen, but I don't know. Hmm. Um, Current current me, um, I, I I try and I I try and straddle the line between owning it and flaunting it. Um, I think it's something that I want to. It's something that I definitely don't want to hide or shy away from. Like it, it is part of my identity, and it's even if I can wear it more comfortably now, it's something that shapes me hugely. And in terms of the stuff I got into, I don't think I would have been doing any of this stuff without the Tourette's. Yeah, yeah. So I feel like I owe it to former me, and the general umbrella that is Tourette's to, to not diminish it, uh, in either sense, but equally, it's not something that I, I don't want people to piggyback off that and, and take a complex issue, which is what it is complex and nuanced and make it into something bite-sized and hyper palatable and yeah. headline friendly and that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that, that's one of the best ways I've ever heard it put, uh, and, and just explaining why it's an issue it mm. is, 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 I mean, I, I just love the way you worded it, that, you know, it's, p- people do love the quick explanation, the really aggregated version of something so they can understand the quickly, but the, the mm-hmm. tweet length kind of explanation of what anything is. And mm-hmm. it, it'd be nice to be able to summarize the whole thing in one sentence, but just all the nuance in there that people are going to miss. Mm-hmm. And the, you know, if you use general language to convey something, you know, what gets lost there and, and how it might not be quite as relatable as, as what you see it as. And yeah. I mean, that's, that's a really valid point as to, to why someone would want to, you know, talk openly about it or not, just because it's, I, I think me too, with uh, other people who have other things in their lives mm-hmm. that, are are not the same background as me. They're not the same kind of person as me. I what they're going through is none of my business. But I appreciate mm-hmm. sort of where they're coming from, even if I don't really understand it the, the same way they do, or to the same degree that they do, because they're living it. And um, that I, I think having Tourette syndrome kind of makes me. I I I really wouldn't know otherwise. But I think mm-hmm. having Tourette sy- syndrome kind of makes me um, better at appreciating other things like that that other people go through because i know it's way more nuanced than i'm yeah. able to understand myself mm-hmm. no i know I, I get that man it's um this is this is kind of what um actually i don't think i did say this but i think if maybe maybe i'm thinking of something that you've asked someone else in a previous podcast but or just something that i've asked that i've definitely asked myself over the years is and actually it's relevant to the drugs conversation like is it if you could get rid of it would you get rid of it yeah, yeah. And in a broader sense, if you could get rid of it from the beginning, if you could somehow travel back in that in that time frame and get rid of it, then would you would you knowingly get rid of it and all its implications for better or worse? Um, and mm-hmm. my personal response to that would be, 
a hundred percent no. Right. Yeah. Same here. And to tie it into what you were saying directly is like, I, I completely don't get this, this right. And I'm a human at the end of the day. And like at points profoundly egocentric and yeah, I put myself mm-hmm. above others and other times get it more right and kind of oscillate somewhere between <laughs> the better way around and the ego way around. But generally speaking, like the whole Tourette's journey, it's, it's not only taught me stuff about myself, but like the crash course in empathy that it's been. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. And the, I don't know. I, yeah. Like the older, the older I'm getting, like the more I feel like, I feel like that's it. That's the thing. Cultivation of empathy is, is, is got to be there with like the central things of what helps <laughs> generally. Right, yeah. Mm. Um, and for, and for me, Tourette's with Tourette's was that, um, like, and, and again, like, like you say, in terms of other people's experience for someone else, it will be, well, you, well it, it kind of doesn't matter what it is. Cause for someone else, it will be the hardest thing that they've had to experience. And that's the nature of relativity in these contexts. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But knowing that you've had something impossible to experience and <laughs> opening your eyes <laughs> to the possibility that someone else has probably had something that was impossible to experience. Like that's. That I think only really truly comes from experiencing impossible things or very difficult things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so full yeah. circle. Yeah, um, thinking that through is is a great way to not necessarily be sure about in, in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned skepticism and all that. I think it's a it's a very healthy way to not really be a hundred percent sure about anything you really perceive in the world without experience experiencing it. You know yourself. And th- that is something <laughs> that yeah, yeah. I I can definitely trace to to having TS. And so that, that makes me wonder, though, do, do you talk with other Tourettes or is that opportunity there for you out, outside of us talking here? I was about to say, I'm, not, I'm doing it now, but this is one of the few times, probably one of the, hang on, like, is this the only time I've ever really spoken about, as in I've spoken to close friends about, about experiences with Tourette's, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of other people with Tourette's, um, I actually met a guy quite recently on a, on a job the other year. Um, he was the first person in my life I'd, I'd met with Tourette's. Like I've often suspected, because you, you, you must have like a Tourette's radar, right? You, you, you see people, you see people like, it's like, you've done that twice. Oh, yeah. You've got it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, you try not, you know, you try not to stare or single them out or anything, but it's like somewhere in the head, it's like, ah, cool, one of us. Like, even if that's... Right, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, but I actually, yeah, met someone a couple of years ago who, um, yeah, again, similarly, I noticed just a, a couple of things like, surely there's different ticks, vocal and motor. <laughs> it's like a little checklist <laughs> yeah, it's, picking it's up coming there. together. Yeah. And um, <laughs> it's a really lovely guy. I, I, won't, I won't mention his name because I respect his, his independence and his own time and stuff. But yeah, um, sure. really cool guy. Um, and yeah, we, we had a, 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 just some very casual conversations around Tourette's. More just along the lines of, hey, do you have Tourette's? Yeah, me too. Cool. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's stuff like at some point, I, yeah, I guess the, you know, we're, we're probably at the level of introductory friendship level. So yes, see, see which way it goes. Maybe we'll end up having more conversations over time. Um, it would, it would be cool too. Um, but yes, yeah, it was nice to actually meet someone in, in, in real life with it. Cause I keep, I keep yeah, hearing these yeah. statistics on and off that like, was it like something like one in a hundred people has it, I, which I really don't believe <laughs> yeah it, the, depending on the source it's i i see that number fluctuate yeah. a lot um so so i i don't really know what the I, I i know the there's an opinion out there and that's probably accurate with with uh with any sort of diagnosable thing mm-hmm. is that it's probably underdiagnosed and you know more people th- there may be you know cultural stigma yeah. and things like that yeah, 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 yeah. I, but th- there is i don't know i mean th- this sounds like i'm just talking about the podcast but th- there is something just very nice about and the way we've gone about it here too is we've been talking about Tourette syndrome but it has just kind of been a a freewheeling yeah. conversation of and we're able to kind of identify these commonalities and it's just I'll never be able to understand and appreciate every nuance that you have in your mind with Tourette syndrome and how it affects you well, and likewise, no, of course. it's it's impossible to to really lay out there so you know in one sense these these conversations are are, are limited in that regard, but we can still, I think, conceptually understand mm. that that is a fact, that, that there's so much to it that we will never be able to, you know, c- certainly not in, in an hour-long podcast, uh, able to, to capture this kind of thing. But 
there was something nice and just kind of listening to it. And that, that's, um, and, and listening to two people talk about something that they can both relate to. I'm not just talking about this podcast in particular. It could be anything, but, <laughs> no, um, I hear you, man. but, 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 but it helps me to talk to you. You know, it, 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 it gets me somewhere to be able to talk to you and, and learn more about myself. And it's, you know, and, and it's different every single, every single time I talk to somebody on here, yeah. I, I get that same takeaway, but in a different way. And it's, uh, so that's why I asked if you had ever talked with other people who have Tourette syndrome and, you know, did you learn something new? And, but I mean, it's, it's a total universe. Mm -hmm. No, the, th the thing I was going to say was like, even if, even if I did know loads of people with Tourette's, which, which I, which I don't, not, not in, actually, I was going to say not even in person, but it's not even online. Like I know you and I don't know, but I've heard like 40% of the podcasts that have come out so far, which I need to catch up on and I will at some point. <laughs> but um, even if I did know a lot more people, I'm not, I'm not so sure that it, this is going to be a roundabout way of affirming what you've just said, because I do love the solidarity that comes with something like this. But I also, I also, at least at an initial level, I also kind of love the distance as well, because yeah. The, the thing that specifically, or the thing rather that is completely specific to Tourette's as opposed to talking about any other issue that I might have experienced, it's the tick elements. Like, and everyone has different ticks, and I don't know what you're like, but if I see someone else doing something, like, there's a part of my brain which is like, that's cool. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> and, <laughs> and kind of getting on the action. Like, it's happened to me with other stuff. I mean, most of my most, most persistent ticks, like, like I was saying with the head snapping thing, which has taken me yeah. years to learn how to slightly control and, and diminish. And it's still there. Um, but I just know, mm -hmm. like, for me, I don't want to overstate the word danger, but it's like, for me, it's a genuine risk. It's like, do I really want to like open my brain up to the possibility of acquiring like a, a whole new set of, <laughs> <laughs> they're not even tools, they're weapons, like in that sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, it's just, it's, it's a really crazy phenomenon. Cause I remember just after I'd been diagnosed, um, the BBC, got quite into Tourette's coincidentally inside airing. Well, they seem to do this like at sort of six or seven year intervals. And they usually <laughs> highly tip towards the, um, like the pre-existing media stereotypes. And they don't really do much to, like we're saying, to deal with like, the nuance and the complexities of it. Yeah. Like, yeah. The whole, the scope of the whole condition. It's, it's, they, they can pretend it is in their little footnotes to the program, but secretly they know that they want people to watch that show. And the only way they're going to get people to watch it who want quick answers to things is yep. to make, anyway, attention grabbing stuff. But, but I remember when I used to watch these things, like I sometimes would watch a couple of them for like two or three minutes. And then, I, and it kind of brings me to tears sometimes, but I'd have to sort of walk off from it and to completely cut myself off from the show because I could feel myself while I was watching it replicate these things that I'd never done before, but I'd seen other people doing. Um, and on the one hand, you could say that is the most e egocentric reading of someone else's experience, <laughs> but it's kind of <laughs> a bit more transcendent than that. And it's in one crazy sense, I, I think it's, I think it's almost more sympathetic than egocentric. Um, it's somewhere, it's somewhere that oscillates weirdly between those two. It's like, you have something that's amazing and I want that, but equally like, ah, oh, you have something and I can be more like you or we're like each other, that kind of thing. I, I don't know. I don't know how the brain works, but I feel like something on behind the scenes was going on like that, but I didn't really like that. Um, so in terms of actually the idea of being in a room full of people with a whole bunch of collection of ticks as admirable and incredible as I think that stuff is and hats off to people that do it. Cause I think it's amazing stuff for me. I'm not sure that it would be the right thing. That's why I like the emotional and probably more the physical distance of something like a podcast, at least as an introductory thing. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. Yeah. But going back to the nuances we were talking about, I mean, it's just, there's so much to it and there's so much I have yet to learn. Yeah. And I'm not a Tourette syndrome expert. I, I just, I, I just know that I want to know more and I want to talk to more people who, mm -hmm. you know, may or may not experience the same things I do. And yeah, yeah. it's, um, it's, it's funny how often we do intersect on, these sort of like, uh, is just that they feel like major coincidences, mm. but they happen so often that like, okay, there, it feels like there's something, this isn't scientific, but it feels like there's something there. 100%. Mm -hmm. um, no, the thing I was, the thing I was thinking when you were talking about the podcast and hearing other people's experiences of it and not to diminish the experiences of those who are featured on TV, but, but if anything, just flinging it open, it's like, that's true, but there's more truth, like, and there's lots of truths and this truth looks different to that truth and all that kind of stuff. Like, one of the things I was thinking is like this, this podcast genuinely, like 
regardless of whether I'd known what Tourette's was when I was a teenager, um, it would have been an incredible thing to have experienced, to have been part of, to have been able to listen to it at that point. Mm. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing resource to have now, like knowing what I have. Um, but the idea of people being able to actually hear this, maybe being on the fence either with their own senses of identity and maybe some kind of inclination that maybe they have something that, that, that looks like this or someone they know does. Um, and kind of, I don't know, being able to hear about it in a, in a safe space as well. And I don't know, man, the diversity of it as well. The fact that this isn't, this isn't a Wikipedia article, it's not a checklist. It's partly that, mm-hmm. but it's also more than that. It's the quantifiable and it's the stuff in between. It's, I think it's incredible. Like, um, and it does to draw what might be a potentially shit analogy. It kind of reminded me of, well, not reminded me because it, most of it hasn't really happened yet, but made me think of this whole movement towards autonomous cars. There's a whole debate about whether or not that's good, mm-hmm. and you're going to hear where I'm going with this. I'll try and make it quick. <laughs> but like, short term, there might be some risk with autonomous cars. Like, they, you know, the, the, we've already had it, like a Google car killed someone or whatever. Not whatever, like, but right. something like that happened, and it was terrible, and nothing will change that. But the difference between an autonomous vehicle plugged into a network of other autonomous vehicles doing that. And the difference between someone getting drunk one night and killing someone is yeah. that that mm-hmm. autonomous car, by doing that, as much as it was horrific, by sharing that information with this network of other autonomous vehicles, drastically decreases the risk of something like that ever happening again. Yeah. And I feel like yeah. on some kind of level with this, it's, I guess you could apply this to, <laughs> it's probably not specific to the Tourette's podcast, but like it, the general sense of community and why it's good and sharing stuff. I, I really, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just that kind of power and numbers thing. And like, it's not just my story and yours. It's like that, but exponentially multiplied and disseminated. It's yeah. I, I really like that analogy. I, I'm going to work on it. No, no, no. I, I, I really like it. I mean, I, and again, um, I'm speaking as somebody who I, I see, the podcast is something that I'm I ha- I'm happy to participate in, and it's just the benefit for me is just talking to other people and developing more of a geography in my mind of kind of where we're at with Tourette syndrome and what people who do have it want other people to know about it and 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 finding those intersections. I mean, it, it it's um, because I don't even really know what I'm yeah. looking for. It's just I just wanted the opportunity to to learn more about it and talk about it and kind of i guess compare or contrast my life with other people mm-hmm. who've been through it but also to see what we can learn and whatever comes of this mm-hmm. is what comes of it and just and fortunately it's it's been very positive and but but it's it's entirely because of the community support and it, it's it surprises me endlessly that 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 it's gone as far as it, as it does because I've, I've said in past episodes, I thought I would just, you know, get a few people willing to talk about mm-hmm. it and that would be it. The podcast would be dead, didn't even really take off and, and that's it. And, and just the, the, the fact that it, it brought out a, um, an eagerness mm-hmm. in, especially the adult population of people who have Tourette syndrome to talk about it in a different way than they typically see it being mm-hmm. talked about is, I, I mean, I, I think that's sort of the ultimate and we're talking about it. And, you know, I had no sense of where this whole thing was going to go. And I never do, uh, except the more I do it, the, you know, the, the more of these intersections we end up finding. Yeah. If that makes sense. No, no, no. A hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. No, it's, it's a cool thing that's going on. Um, just as a, as a minor tangent, it's like kind of on the, on the TV show and slightly, um, sensationalized portrayal of, oh, maybe I shouldn't even say that. Like, but like, like the sort of micro non nuanced portrayal of Tourette syndrome. I was actually interviewed for mm-hmm. one of these, for one of these documentaries back in 2011. You were? Um, yeah. Yeah. Like a producer came to, to visit me at a friend's house where I was playing piano. And we, we had a little chat about stuff and it wasn't far off the stuff I've said to you now, but like, I, I could kind of see the disappointment in her eyes as we were speaking. It's like, I wasn't, I don't think I was doing <laughs> enough stuff. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't moving. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. And, what, what a letdown. I, yeah. And I was on standard, I was in standard human watch mode. So if you put me in like, I don't know, it was like a secret camera. Maybe you would have seen things going on, but like, yeah, I was, I just, yeah, I, I it could be just that, that my story was incredibly boring or whatever, but to me that just <laughs> said like, I'm giving you an honest portrayal of what it's like to have Tourette's, but not to have the kind of Tourette's that you always show. Yeah. Fair play. That's not interesting, but, that's what I got from that is like, that doesn't seem interesting on a production level. You know, it, it makes me more conscious of, 
uh, the fact that there are probably a million misconceptions in my head, mm-hmm. just just things that I, uh, you know, we know the world that we know, we know the world that we've seen in front of us, but it's also filtered through the the, the cultural matrix, I guess is 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 what some people call it, mm-hmm. where it's just your 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 experience and your perception is going to be shaped by what you think you already know, and. Even if I can't identify what these misconceptions are in my head, I know I got them, and it makes me uh, way more willing to <clears throat> to learn about things that that I know I'm not an expert on, mm-hmm. and hear people's personal stories, and uh, you know, it, I mean, you, you hear you hear diabetics talk about it too, where. Mm-hmm. They may have the type that people think, oh, well, you know, this is something you did to yourself because you have horrible eating habits. And they're like, well, no, this is not that kind of diabetes. This is something. So there's a stigma yeah. there, too. And that's something I I just I, I didn't know that. I didn't know that until I didn't have any negative judgments about people with diabetes. Yeah. But I didn't really know how, you know, what, what the breakdown was like. Mm-hmm. And and there are actually some Tourette's listening who who deal with that stigma as well. Mm-hmm. But it's just it just kind of reinforces the point that I need to kind of loosen up the the walls of my brain in terms of what needs to go and and absorbing new information by hearing people talk about it and how the science has evolved over time. And even still to this day, when I tell people that I have Tourette syndrome, usually sometimes the story will go into, oh, I had a friend who had Tourette syndrome, and it's every single time is the stereotypical version. And I'm not saying they're lying. But it, it just, it comes up so often where it's like, you know. You know when you, you know if you meet someone like if you're traveling or something or, or just a friend at like a party or a gathering or something and like there's a mutual city mentioned. It's, uh, let's, let's, take, let's take New York in the States, for example. And I'd be like, yeah, oh, cool. I have a friend in New York. As if like, you must know each other. You must do the same things. And like, it's. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, yeah. Like yeah. 300 billion different possibilities i don't mean in terms of population but in terms of like probability and stuff like that but like yeah it's (laughs) but yeah 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 no (laughs) equally complicit in that stuff on my part as well man but it's um um but you were asking about kind of the trajectory of ticks i guess or my experience right yeah um i mean how would you say it's been for you i i think it's been uh, so I'll have ups and downs, mm-hmm. uh, and, and my ticks will fluctuate and I'll have some ticks that, you know, will dominate me for a bit. They'll totally go away. They'll be replaced by a different tick. And, uh, sometimes I'll, you know, and this happens a lot with a podcast where I'm talking about my past ticks and mm-hmm. ticks that haven't happened for a while. Then they just reemerge because mm-hmm. my brain has been reminded of them. And, yeah. um, I would say overall, mm-hmm. uh, even though I've had ups and downs over the years, if you looked at sort of a chart or some sort of line graph of my, you know, teoretic activity over the years, and you drew a line through it, mm-hmm. it would be a fairly flat line. Mm-hmm. When I was, when I was young, uh, you know, I had just a, a lot of blatantly obvious, very visible ticks. But, um, but I think what, what you were saying earlier about just kind of knowing how to own them better and manage them better mm-hmm sort of influences uh, my perception of my own tics and and yeah. what kind of Tourette syndrome I have, so to speak. And mm-hmm. is it going away? Is it getting better? Or is it just that I've learned how to kind of live with it better mm. and everything otherwise has kind of technically been the same with me. So I feel like I'm kind of flattened out. Um, and and then self-accepting and all of that, mm-hmm. which I didn't do before uh, until, you know, a, a year or so ago, mm. uh, has has absolutely helped. So I can say my lived experience with Tourette syndrome, if if that was a line graph, would just be going up in a completely positive direction. And uh, it feels really good to be at this point to be able to kind of talk openly about it. Mm-hmm. Again, no disrespect to anybody who wants to to keep it private because it's nobody else's business but your own. But mm-hmm. but yeah, that that's I feel like that kind of gets at my mm-hmm. my experience and kind of where I am right now. No, that's interesting. I th- I think. I think there's massive overlap in that for me as well. Um, I guess I guess the fundamental difference would be the, the different stages in which we were we were diagnosed. Um, in that, I think that's for me that's probably what's a bit different because when the diagnosis came, when I when I knew what it was, I think that yeah. helped a lot. Um, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, well, it's just a it's a point. Yeah, it's just it's just a point of difference, really. Like, and I say the other thing as well that I that I'd imagine is because I fully agree with like 
self acceptance and, and and diagnosis plays a huge a huge part in that. But yeah, the self acceptance thing I think is instrumental in in the management of of the tits. But I think this this venture that you've undertaken because you mentioned a year ago, and I'm assuming that was when you started the podcast, right? That's um, right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The beginning of 2018. So that's 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 huge. I think it would probably be something close to a flatline. I think there would have been a definite. Uh, I think there probably would have been a dip, uh, probably in late teens, because I think there's probably other stuff going on as well then. Mm. Um, some of it environmental, some of it biological. I just think maybe my body wasn't giving me the biggest helping hand at that time anyway. So I think there's, there's, there's that kind of thing. There might have been a little dip then. Then maybe the diagnosis, like a slightly further dip. But it's a, it's a really hard one to quantify. Yeah. Um, because I still feel maybe I'm less aware of it and maybe that's, maybe that's a self-acceptance thing. Um, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and also the amount of time I've had it for, and I've, if I take if I take the head jerking tick as an example, like when I was sixteen and it first started, it would be like <laughs> perpendicular to ninety degrees. It would be like that noticeable, like smash, smash. Like, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. The same tick happens, like with the same frequency of movement, I think, but the arc of the movement is tiny like almost negligible compared to, to what it was like. Now it's like if someone was in a boring conversation, they were barely agreeing with a point and had to nod their head along. It's kind of at that level maybe. And and to the point where I think when people see it, they often think I'm just being <laughs> really agreeable with whatever they're talking about. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's been misconstrued at points as well. Like, like probably the best memory I have of this is a, a friend of mine years ago who I met on like a retreat type thing. Um, and she was doing breakfast that morning and asked me if I wanted boiled egg. I never used to eat boiled eggs, but my Tourette's went off at that particular moment and nodded two or three times. And so a few minutes later, I ended up with an egg. And when I said, oh, it's really kind, but I don't actually eat them. She was like, what, but you said you wanted one. Like, oh, okay, okay, now's the time for that conversation. So it's called Tourette's syndrome. Right? <laughs> um, <laughs> but my, my point was meant to be that um, over the years, yeah, definitely. I was using that one as an example, that the head jerk and said, like, it's become what I would like to think is barely noticeable. Um, and the same is true of other ones. Like, I don't know if you have a similar kind of thing, but um, I sometimes get ticks like muscular type things on different sides of my body. Um, and often, oh, yeah, often they yeah, help absolutely. hugely. Yeah, exactly. Often they help hugely because they'll be under clothing. So it'll be like, I don't know, like something on my chest or like on my knee or my calf or something. And that's amazing because no one's right. ever going to have any idea. But with the stuff that I get a lot of facial ones as well. Um, yeah. and some way more noticeable than others. Um, but what I've been able to do over time with those is, and I didn't even think it was a conscious thing. I think it just happened almost out of necessity and survival, um, without wanting <laughs> to imbue it with too much of a sense of, uh, severity or whatever. But like, um, I think I, they started kind of moving to the sides of the face that weren't actively present in the conversation. So if someone was mainly seeing my left side, hmm. my right side would kick in and take over on the tick side. Oh, huh, okay. But so, yeah, I appreciate that kind of takes it in a slightly different direction to what you're asking about the general trajectory of them. Like, I, I feel like they're really, they're really present um, in terms of quantity, but I just think they're less noticeable. So, yeah, I, I don't know if I could say that might have been, like, like you said, for yours, flatline the whole way, but um, I'd say... So it's probably like a downward trajectory. Um, definitely in a much happier place with it. I mean, it's it's something in all honesty, and, I, and, I, and I'm very grateful to, to you and the podcast for this. It's something that I think I'd almost convinced myself didn't matter anymore. And yeah, actually listening more to the podcast and kind of re-engaging with it, it's like, well, what are you talking about, man? Like this is this is part of you. This is how you got here. Even if it's not quite as visibly relevant to your day-to-day interactions in life as it maybe was. It's um, it's a hundred percent interwoven in the foundations of it. So, yeah, definitely feel better about the whole thing, and I'm hoping that's going to be a longer term trajectory. Like, and obviously there's blips, and some days it feels shit, and other days I forget I have it, and other days I feel like a fraud. But the general thing is 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 towards like you were saying, like like self acceptance, and yeah. Mm-hmm. I'll have a link to the work of Alex Kozabalas in the show notes with this episode. 
at tourettespodcast.libsyn.com. L-I-B-S-Y-N. tourettespodcast.libsyn.com. And of course, we'll be sharing it on social media as well. Alex, thank you so much. This was an awesome episode. You feel like a brother, and I hope to meet you the next time I'm over there. Oh, speaking of social media, and the time I was recording the intro to this episode, my wife took the initiative and set up a Tourette's Podcast Instagram page. Tourette's Podcast is the handle, all one word, that's how you can look it up. And that's where we'll just expand the media reach of this podcast with photographs related to the episodes that come out each week and behind the scenes stuff related to the production here in the studio and announcements and and give me your ideas. You know, what would a Tourette's Podcast Instagram page need, in your opinion? My wife, Ambrose, already has a lot of great ideas for it. She's awesome, y'all. I appreciate my wife, who obviously gives 100% support to the show. Love you. Speaking of great photographers, by the way, my wife. If you'd like to become a patron of the show and just give a few dollars to it to support the production effort, no pressure to do so anytime ever. It's always okay if you can't or don't want to. But if you do want to, patreon.com slash Tourette's Podcast. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tourette's Podcast. And enormous thank yous to everybody who signed up to contribute. Truly goes a long way. Uh, Otherwise, there are other ways you can support the show just by telling people about it. Again, if you want to. I hate asking for things, but the the bigger deal is that people write into this show saying that it helps them. And if that was the only goal of the show, I'd be happy. But we can keep it going and we can do more. Give some feedback and we'll discuss it on the next episode next Friday. Until then, Tourette's Podcast at gmail.com. Tourette's Podcast discussion group on Facebook. Thank you, Sophia. At Tourette's Pod on Twitter. We should be on all the podcast players. Let me know if there's one that you use and you just can't find Tourette's Podcast. And I'll correct that. And now we're on Instagram. Tourette's Podcast on Instagram. Thanks so much. Keep the discussion going. Weigh in on this episode. We'll talk about it next week. Thanks again. This is Ben.